Hello, hello. Get out of here. Hi, you're here, second day in a row. I don't know how long I'll stay though. Okay, no worries. I love that you come and that you're also in Wisdom Keeper because I was the thing I'm going to give to again. <laughs> How's your arm? How's your shoulder? It's it's what? It's worse. Um, well, better but worse. I don't know. I don't know. It might be my heart. Uh -huh. This. Um, I might have to leave and go get that checked. Oh, your heart. So, okay. Uh huh. Uh -huh. What are you feeling? Um. Well, I I don't. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I had, I had a physical therapy session today that was like a little intense. And based on that, the physician was like, I think this might be your heart. Okay. So I'm waiting to see if I start to feel anything that I felt earlier. If I do, I have to go to the oh. hospital. If I don't, then I'm okay. I'm just like, but I was getting all in my head and then I was like, it's two o'clock. Let me just hop in this call and yay. Well, I'm glad you decided to be here. Yeah. Yeah. So well, hi. Hi. Well, everyone else. <laughs> uh, Nancy and Marissa are here too. Hi ladies. Hi humans. I'm getting used to being more non-binary when I say hello to people. <laughs> so hello, humans. Because some people may not want to be called ladies. <laughs> I'm learning this. I have a, a manifester Facebook group uh, filled with manifester women from all over the world. And I've got 4,400 manifester females in this group. And I have learned so much about this um, experience of feeling non-binary. There is a lot of female manifestors who prefer not to be called a lady or a woman or these types of things. So hello, beautiful people. <laughs> mm. Hello, Nancy. Hello. Thank you for being here with your beautiful smile. How are you? I'm, I'm in this uh, new home that I just moved in last week, busy with renovation and moving. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, and I was really excited when I saw, oh, you are having a session today. I need to come. <laughs> oh, yay. I miss a lot of uh, um, the, the group uh, activities. Just mm -hmm. I, I couldn't be available, but yeah, it's really enjoyable to hear and hearing you talking about manifestors because uh, I was just having a lot of conversation with a female manifestor. Chinese um, friend and she's also very into human design 6-2 and we're just talking about is really what is a new manifested way of dealing with crisis in the world we are right now is the projected leadership really uh, what is you know when we look at a projected leadership and manifested leadership and we were just talking about when there is something happens injustice happens the manifested way for her as an emotional authority she just want to do it, deal with it, confront mm. the truth on the table at the emotional energy. But then the whole um, justice system, you put people into long trials and periods. After a few years, the victim no longer feel like justified and the perpetrator is no longer punished. And then even the jail system these days, they just, because of due to economical reasons, they don't really punish people the way it is. So there's so much way of getting away from it. So we have a discussion uh, just on the whole, you know, the whole thing about the polarity gate 17 and 18. <laughs> yes. so, oh any justice and what is a new way to do? And I was so um, fascinated with all the conversation, you know, with Manifesto Friend. <laughs> I, and I love that conversation because the way that it, uh, you know, if we look back at the way it used to be, it was chop their heads off. It was, it was honor. It was rectification. It wasn't punishment. It wasn't discipline. It wasn't these types of things. It was, it was rectification of honor off with your head. Mm -hmm. 
And as the manifester came out of power, and I know that sounds very terrible, um, but from a bigger perspective, uh, we're just looking at the story we've been writing. And so the story we've been writing is that's the way that we did things. And then and then we came to a more civilized way, which has now shown itself to be less civilized than preserving honor, because now all parties end in um, dishonor. Um, and so the manifester uh, way of leading, uh, I think, is, uh, well, you brought up two two things there. That directness, I have definitely noticed um, we we get to we get to learn diplomacy. At least I've gotten to learn diplomacy. <laughs> because yes, it's it's on the table and I see it and everyone sees it and it's it's loud and it's screaming and it's bleeding and it's on the table. Why can't we talk about this? What's on the table? It was very hard for me to understand this because I did want to take the initiative. Um, so that's very a beautiful conversation to have. And so I imagine that we will move into when projectors uh, take leadership. When that shift is able to be made, I imagine we move into something of a hybrid, something of a combination of both the justice system and preserving honor swiftly. I hope. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for being here. Um. Pockets, how are you feeling? Um, Nancy and Marissa weren't here when you checked in, so I wanted to give you another opportunity to check in and say hello. Oh, um, um, I don't have words at the moment. Okay, I'm I'm hanging in there. <laughs> okay, well, um, would you mind if I spoke a little bit about the condition that you're in, so that we could all hold present space? Uh huh. Okay. Um. Um. Wow. Pockets is experiencing frozen shoulder syndrome, um, and she is in the process of metaphysical uh, movement through this frozen shoulder. Um, and today she had a um, a session moving this energy, and uh, her heart uh, was showing signs of distress. Um, and so, as strong as Miss Pockets is, she is sitting there and staying present in the moment to her body and to her sensory experiences. Um, and her heart is in perfect rhythm now. And if it changes, she will have to leave. Um, but I hope that we can all hold space for the beating drum of her heart and the release of whatever is holding her shoulder. Thanks for being here, Pockets. Uh, Marissa, I'd love for you to say hello. Uh, she says, oh, no, my mom had this multiple times. Very sorry, sending you love. Oh, Pockets, you're in there. Sorry. I just assume nobody reads the chats. <laughs> Marissa, would you like to come on and, and say hello? Do you have space for that? If not, totally cool, too. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. Thank you for being here, Marissa. Even in the office, I feel honored that um, we have this little group that comes together every week. Um, and not only honored, but still infused, which I'm really excited about. I was real thrilled to... Um, to give you, to, to come up with, to allow. And it just came at the very last moment when I happened to be on Canva and I opened up my Canva to make a logo for something. And I saw a workbook that I have used and made in the past. And it was perfect for this moment. <clears throat> so what I want to offer uh, today is um, a somatic practices. Um, and this is, this is um, the reason that I think this is coming alive in me. I, I'd like to share a little bit about why I think that this is important. Um, not only for those of us who have just joined the experience uh, or the experiment, but for also for those of us who um, have been in the experiment for a while and are starting to feel the traumas release themselves from our body. 
Um, even those who don't have traumas in their body, who just by nature of being a human in the world, you are receiving messages and images and things that leave indelible impressions or belief systems that keep us constricted. And so the reason that I think um, being in communion with our bodies is the best thing is not only can we hear the authority that is trying to be lived through us when we arrive in our bodies, but something else my teacher Joe Dispenza taught me over and over and over again is that in this generous, I'm going to stop sharing that, but in this generous present moment, everything exists. And so if I were teaching next to raw, what I would have taught was that, yes, strategy and authority, but presence as well. It would have been just a, as a key component because in this present moment, when we're not worried about the future or thinking about the past, when we are in this present moment, it is generous. It is full. It it allow, it has every frequency, every synchronicity, every message that is trying to be told to you exists in the field all of the time. It is about us tuning into it like a radio station. And our body is the station. Our body has all the antenna through our senses to tune into what is here in the environment for us. And when I say that, what's for us, what I really mean is we're not, we're not, you know, uh, colonizers taking over things and using it as commerce. No, but, but the universe always has a way of showing you what's next or of providing you exactly what you need, exactly when you need it. Um, whether it be, and I'm not saying that you need a mansion. And so the universe provides you a mansion when you need it. What I'm saying is, is, is when you are present in the moment, not worrying about the future, not worrying about the past, but you're here in this moment, your sensory organs are designed and very well equipped to tune into the thing that supports your life. This is the uh, science of kinesiology. And if anybody's read uh, Dr. David Hawkins, he's one of my favorite. He, he um, has calibrated a scale of consciousness. Uh, one of his books is called Power Versus Force. Um, it's beautiful. And he has calibrated using muscle testing techniques, uh, what supports life and what doesn't support life. Uh, frequencies, feelings, um, inanimate objects, uh, what holds a frequency of supporting life and what doesn't support life. Well, when you use your mind to decide the direction that you're going in, um, your mind is not tuned to the frequency of what supports your life. But when you are present in this very generous moment, your sensory organs are designed to tune into the next right step. It's like, you know, if you imagine a checkerboard floor, you know, it'll light up the next square that you're to walk to. And you will be able to see it when you practice presence, when we are in the moment. All of this is hugely important. There's a huge industry right now of presence, of meditation, of quieting the mind. You know, people pay a lot of money um, to learn to do this. But what I have seen in my practice and in the world around me is that they pay a lot of money to be able to be present, but they are, but they don't spend the time going into the roots of why they are not present. And so even if I learn a meditation technique today, technique, and I use my mind to sit down and do my meditation and I'm successful at it, so I feel as if I am present in the moment, that is not going to last because I have belief systems. I have collapsed the wave function of who I am. I have molecules and density in my body that believe something different. And so, and, and, and that keep me moving into the future or going back to the past. And these mechanisms that exist inside of my body, I've programmed them over years of experience to say, this is what will keep me alive and safe. 
And so unless we address those, we will not be able to hear our body's wisdom. We cannot hear the strategy and authority that is alive in our body through, um, I'm going to use the word trauma, but I don't mean to make it um, hugely dramatic. All of us have trauma. And what I'm going to define as trauma is just like a bruise on your banana. That is trauma to the shell of the banana, you know, whether it be because of age or experience, you know, we threw it in our bag too many times or because it was defective or it's sick or whatever the reason may be, um, the banana experiences life. And because of that, the skin gets a little brown sometimes. And so that's trauma. Um, so, so we all have trauma. Every single one of us have a, uh, a something that we have added to us. Uh, a something, a way that we have changed our natural frequency in order to continue to exist. And in our human design experiment, when we talk about following our bodies and watching the movie, we a lot of us are following our body into the trauma over and over and over again, or following our bodies based on our body's experiences, not on being deconditioned, what Raw says, going all the way back to deconditioning your original biology, the brand new banana before you had any brown marks on you. Um, we can do that through understanding what trauma looks like in the body. I'm sure most of us have read The Body Keeps the Score, or I know Pockets has the uh, Metaphysical Body book. Uh, there's a lot of books out here. Louise Hay was one of the first uh, pioneers of this wisdom of connecting uh, psychosomatic uh, experiences with the inflections or movements of the body. Shamans know this from ages and ages. Um, and so what I want to give is to imagine that, you know, we don't have to go to uh, school, to college, to get this therapy degree, to be able to know these things. I want to teach you how to recognize in your body when trauma shows itself. And when I'm inviting you to do this, I'm inviting you to recognize what your body's doing, not create stories about it. So we're going to go into that a little bit deeper. Let me do that now. Um, I will provide this log to you. Um, I'll put it probably in my room in Discord um, so that you can have this log. It doesn't have a whole lot of room for notes and things, but what I'd like you to do is just pay attention to when, how, uh, and where, who, uh, changes in your body. Who's around? What is happening? Where are you? How did it happen? Um, changes. When, when did the change show up? What is the difference each time? What is the same each time? Are there repeating themes? For instance, I do this all the time. I'm doing this as part of my natural movements in the world. I don't need this piece of paper anymore, but I started with this piece of paper. And so what I'm doing is when I move like this, I know there's not a confidence there. When I, um, there are, and maybe in next, next time we're going to do this next week, we're going to go into what the body movements are of all of the hexagram lines, one, two, three, four, five, six. We're going to talk about what your primal wounding is and the way your body shows up when it is showing wounding, um, according to your body design. But between now and then, I'd like you to write things down. And the things that I'd like you to write down are, you know, when I, I was just in a meeting before this, and I noticed myself get a little agitated and do one of these numbers. And so I'm watching my abs tight, my butt got a little tight, my toes curled a little bit. And I'm watching this happen, uh, watching because I'm on the screen, I was in a meeting. And I was able to, at that moment, see that my body was moving away from what supported life. And so I got to put my brain now, now that my body led the way, now that she gave the clue, now he showed up and said, oh, okay, what doesn't support life about this? And, and, and I, as a manifester, impacted, impacted, impacted in ways that made my body move back forward again. Um, there are little things that happen, such as me not being able to breathe all the way into my diaphragm. I'll do one of these. I'll catch myself breathing that shallow. 
This I know is that I have something to say and I'm afraid to say it. And I only know all of these things based on, on filling out this log over and over and over again for many years of my life, trying to connect my mind and my body. You see, that's where my split is. I have a defined head Najna with all of this beautiful definition and my split is here and I have 43 and I have 56, but no 11 and 23. And I have all open motors in this body and then this perfected form. So it's kind of this dichotomy of, I had no idea what it was like to exist inside of this body until I started logging what the body was doing. And that's how my mind got to know my body and that's how my mind felt safe letting my body learn, uh, lead the way. And now they're married. Now they're integrated. But I had to be able to take them apart before that I could bring them back together again. And so I would like you to notice over the next two weeks, what is your body doing? What does it feel like? What are the senses? What are your stories? Oh, this is a big one. So this whole practice itself really invites us out of our stories. This is a multifold process. Not only is it bringing you into the generous present moment where everything you need exists, but it is also having your mind marry your body. And it is also bringing up every uh, piece of conditioning that you have in your body graph to be able to be re-examined and re-storied, uh, if you will, to, to ask yourself. And, and I'm not saying to ask yourself. I'm saying you will be asked. You will see my story about this is that, oh, that wasn't true or holy cow, that was true. And now I can do something about it. It allows you to arrive in the neurology that you've created in the past about this sensory experience in your body. And it allows you to put your today eyes on it and decide if that's still true. Is that the thing that supports life now? You know, and so it allows you to continually be in the present moment because you can start trusting that your body is going to tell you everything you need to know, right? We sometimes get frozen shoulder and we go try to know what's happening out there. We need to know. But what's happening is if we, uh, and, and Pockets and I have spent a lot of time talking about this, Pockets is a huge proponent of understanding the metaphysics of the body. And this is why I know that it's so beautiful that the universe is putting her through this gauntlet <laughs> because she's here to learn this. She asked for this. You know, she said, I want to learn how to do this. And the universe said, oh, here it is. And so now we, as her allies, get to support her and uplift her um, in this quest that she is on to connect this mind and this body and to hear the signs and signals before she, this, this body, before she decides to scream and yell, right? Because the feminine, the feminine way of being angry is to be quiet, be quiet, be quiet, and then chop a head off. Well, this is what our bodies do. This is why, you know, my autoimmune disorder snuck up on me and all of a sudden I was having a deteriorated brainstem and, and uh, going into anaphylaxis every time I ate. It was because she was saying it. She was saying, hey, baby, this isn't right. Hey, this isn't right. Hey, this isn't right. Hey, this isn't right. She was doing that for years and he didn't listen. He said, well, but I got to do this and I got to do that and I got to do this and I have to do this. Um, I want to see that. Oh, that was Marissa that dropped off. Okay. Pockets, you're in my heart. So I just wanted to see if that was you. Um. So the general feminine way of expressing anger is to wait until a decision has to be made. And now everybody's upset. You know, the whole realm is having an issue. And so, oh, Marissa's back. So, okay. I went all over the place there, guys. <laughs> I would like you for the next two weeks to pay attention to your body and pay attention to what the stories are that you put on your body. And now when I'm saying, what are we paying attention to? Um, here are some, some things that you can look at, you know, upright, collapsed. Are your shoulders back or are they forward? Are you slumped? Are you tight? Are you stiff? 
Um, are your legs tucked? Are they crossed? Are you moving? Are you sweating? Um, is your jaw tight? Is your, is your mouth closed or is it slightly just resting? How's your belly? Can you breathe all the way into it? Or are you breathing like from here? How are your eyes? Oh gosh, I just realized I was like this. So how are your eyes? How's my shoulders? How's my jaw? What's the back of my neck? When I decide I want to, or when I find myself uh, breaking eye contact with somebody, that's a pure cue that she, my inner child has arrived. Uh, when I cannot make eye contact, when I am making direct eye contact, I feel confident and secure. And there is some, so I'd like you to notice what your body is doing and let's put some information. Let's give him some food so that he can start to integrate and feel safe letting the body be the way. All things you can look at. Um, not just in yourself, but in the people around you too. And I'm not, I'm not suggesting that you go out and you say, oh, your arms are crossed. What does this mean for you? I'm not suggesting this at all. But what I am saying is that when we see, um, when we see people having the, their bodies having this response and we hear their mouths saying something different, we can find ourselves in a place of compassion, understanding that there is dissonance there. It's more easily, easily seen and spotted in another, which then brings compassion to us all. Um, and, and it, and it helps take it from being personal that this person is having this response to you. It takes it from being your fault to seeing that there's a dysregulation in the human in front of you. So a lot of these are all signs of dysregulation. Uh, I see I've got some spell check issues, so I'm going to fix that, uh, before I post it. Um, but I want you to be able to recognize this in your body and in another's body. Um, so this trauma arousal, so we've got hyper, we've got these gestures and expressions. So this is tracking the body. This doesn't always mean trauma, this holding your arms and legs or curving your spine or your belly. These are just things to pay attention to. But these next ones that we have on this tool 19, page 61, these are the hyper and hypo arousal cues. So you will be able to see uh, what after these two weeks, when you start identifying what your body is doing and what story there is, right? I'm not asking you to find your trauma right now. The very first step is, is tracking your body and putting down what story you have about it. That's it. That's all. Then once you are able to do that, once he, once your brain, your neurology is able to start seeing that and it does it as its natural part of being in existence. Oh, my legs are crossed. Interesting. Oh, I moved away from that person. Interesting. You know, and the brain starts recognizing those things as a second order effect or as an unconscious thing. Now what will happen is you're, you'll start being able to see what your normal body movements are and when they get exaggerated. And that's where our trauma lives. Our trauma lives in our hyper and hypo arousal. So it's either I'm hyper aroused, right? Or I'm depressive. It's one of the two. But um, this is tracking for trauma cues is the best indication that you get emotionally overwhelmed, agitated, you're beginning to freeze or disassociate. Um, these are important things for us to know. Um, you know, in my career, it's always been like the therapist is the one that you go to, you know, to get help and get seen in these areas. But what I know to be true, you guys is because we are nine centered beings and because we are here to lead ourselves and to listen to ourselves, there is no one outside that can see like you can. And they're not responsible for it either. I believe this structure gets to go away of you going to someone else to be therapized. I believe that you would go to someone else so that they can teach you how to therapize yourself. Um, because there are, I mean, there are things that I can teach you, but I can't teach you to notice yourself. Um, you can teach you how to do that. I want to give you the tools that the patriarchy has said that only therapists can have. I'm going to give you these tools so that you can learn to be your own therapist in this way. 
And all I mean by that is to see where your trauma lives and ask it if it's real still. Um, so some of these are your eyes. Definitely your eyes are one of the first things that change. Um, skin gets flush. You might not notice that at first. You will notice the emotional, the irritation, the anger, the jumpy, jittery, nervous. Oh, vigilance, hypervigilance is something that has been um, exalted in our culture. This hypervigilance, this, if you see it reported or, you know, did you do this? Did you do that? What's your five-year plan? What's your 10-year plan? What's your this? What's your that? Just hypervigilance to everything that's going on. And we're all a bunch of squirrels running around, chickmunks, like trying to make ourselves happy and safe and squirrel, put our nuts away and, and don't die and be vigilant to the sounds and the movements. And what did that mean when they said that? This is trauma. This is not natural. We are designed as a species to have a, a signature, right? The generator is satisfaction, the manifester is peace, the projector is success, and the reflector is surprise. And that, that's your regulated state. Anytime we are, we are hypervigilant or we, um, even if we're high or low sound and a, and a sound comes, you know, if your body reacts, if that's your variable, that's one thing. But when you're, uh, and if you're fear motivated, that's also another thing. This doesn't mean that you're here to be afraid. It means that you are here to be so intelligent that you secure your survival before fear is needed. And so when, you know, some people say that uh, hypervigilance is part of the design, and I would beg to differ in lots of ways and love to have that conversation. Um, heat rising in the body, sweating, oh my gosh sweating, uh, like cold sweats. This is something that happens to me that it's one of my first cues is that I, I got this overactive right pit, too much information, I'm sure, but we're friends here <laughs> that overreacts when I stress out. This is my spleen giving me signs. And so whether or not you have a defined spleen or an undefined spleen, it still is designed to keep you safe. It's just doing it in two different ways. Memory loss gaps, mind racing. Uh, I can't, uh, not being able to sustain eye contact, no matter how hard I try, that's a pure sign, again, that my inner child has arrived. Um, and then the hypo arousal. So this is a little, this is when it goes into the depressive state or the more melancholy state. And there is a difference between melancholy and these trauma cues. And so I want to talk about that a little bit because we can be depressed or melancholic um, and not traumatized. We can be depressed and peaceful, depressed and satisfied, depressed and successful, depressed. And I want to use maybe melancholy rather than this clinical word depressed, but we can have that experience of just being inverted and um, tired and uh, not being able to see the colors of life and still have our signature. So I'm going to provide these documents um, and this will be instructions. I'm going to fix it a bit because I can see it's not working. Um, so I'm going to fix this a little bit and I'm going to provide this for you. How did you feel about your body? How I think about my body, how I feel about my body, what triggered me today, what helped today was. So there's a whole befriending. There's a lot of things that I'd like to provide and I'll put them in the, in the room on discord and use them or not um, make them different. I'd love, uh, something that looked a little better again, as a manifester, I'm here to start it. Uh, this could definitely be polished and, and made better. Um, so I would love to share, have you share that with me if you do. Um, yeah. So I'm going to send that to you guys, but now, or, and now,
I would love to hear, we're all at different spots in our uh, human design journeys. We're all at different places. We're all at different years. We're all, we're all in kind, all kinds of different spaces. So I would love to hear what your journey was like um, listening to your body. You know, we hear Ra talk about watching the movie. When did you realize that you were actually watching the movie? When did you realize maybe that you were two different parts, that you were you, that you weren't even inside of your body, that you didn't inhabit it, you just drug it around, or the opposite? I'd love to hear from you on this topic and uh, kind of develop for the other people that come to watch this uh, what it could look like to get back into the body and live here as a passenger. Go ahead, Nancy. Yeah, thank you thank so you much, so Brandy, much. for sh sharing um, all these, you know, the differentiation between the trauma, the trigger, and the actual happening. <laughs> there mm -hmm. has been a big thing in before human design, spent all the years watching and observing, but not until really recent. I just see so clearly for me with a white split. <laughs> how constantly there is a fight one part of my body the mind especially my mind one part is this 43 23 and it's just like projected away for me to see i often felt i shouldn't do this but i made a decision for this oh is it really right there is constantly challenging to the decision and my body just goes with uh-huh uh -uh, very simple no objections but the mind yeah. constantly objecting and uh, just more recent, I just also see how the whole thing with it feels like this channel of transitoriness with the 36 crisis. My mind constantly perceive myself in the crisis. And there is this out of the presence. So I brought me, so the, my mind just wanted to open my eyes to see. When I open my eyes, I can only see the front. I can't see the back. I can't see the, the, the inside of me. So there is this searching for certain security from the future and to prove that my mind is right. I'm doing an absolutely wrong thing. Mm -hmm. And then all, all the way have to wait until the experience tells me, actually, a few months ago, I ordered this um, was a shatters that works. But my mind in these three months was like fighting against myself. See, this is what you did. And even with human design tour or undefined ego, it can use as a way to say, see, you are wasting money. Is your undefined ego. This is vanity. And so there is a lot of even use the knowledge to beat myself up. Yeah. And so I just watch these funny things constantly happening all the time. It's like all the time, different parts of my body and hard to make a decision. And then the other thing I noticed too is even with speaking in their group, my tendency is play the civilizer game. I wait until very last when no one really speaks and am I really invited? If not, I shouldn't. Uh, there is, I need to put my hands up. That kind of scenario with my childhood uh, civilized way brought up in a generator and projected way more like that rather than you can just inform if you wanted to and you yeah. don't need to give away. <laughs> and, and it took me a while to feel, oh, this is inf deflation in me, the culture, the, the background, and that maybe the trauma, and even when you talk about the eye contact, the second line has always been the trauma. There's a lot uh -huh. of trauma associated with the second line. So direct eye contact, I cannot see the truth in the other when they, when they are speaking to me about the lies, when they're telling me they're happy, but they are not. It hurts so much to see them directly. So I just avoiding the contact or avoiding to let them see me too. Because I don't feel there's a trust inside. So I can feel there is this rebuilding of trust. Can I just turn up and just be me and doesn't matter <laughs> and just be casual? I don't need to be formal. The sixth line part of me, there is this perfectionism. I need to be a certain way or per in a certain way more perfect to show up. Yeah, so it's quite, uh, I would say, like today when my friends ask me, do you still, do you hate your mom for traumatizing you? And I laugh about it because the struggler in me, my channel of struggling, I realize I couldn't struggle to hate people because it's not worthwhile. It right. just doesn't. It doesn't. I, I don't struggle to hate. 
I struggle to love. I struggle to not love when I truly love. I struggle the reverse way. It's not I struggle for the truth. If it's the truth, I hate for true. But I know it's not real too. Right. So it's so lovable and I mean lovable and lovable. And when I see all the childhood story I used to be so attached to victimization, story I believe in so deeply, the day when the illusion, the bubble just collapsed, I I still, I would say, I would say, I can still see my mother is still the way she is. Uh, the childhood story is still there. But I also see she's just a human. She doesn't need to love me too. Like the suffering comes when we believe our mother needs to love me. My partner needs to love me. My children need to love me. No, they don't. I don't even need to love myself. If I don't, I don't, for real. For real. Yeah. If I do, I do. Not because your mother, my children. It's not because I am me. I'm truly me or I'm not truly me. I love or don't. It's not. So, yeah, that's a liberation. <laughs> oh, I love what you said, Nancy, because you said it exactly the way that I think Ra was trying to say it, but that he had to show what was bad first. But if you if you got hung up on what was bad and wrong, then you missed the point of what he was trying to actually point to. And like you said, the channel of struggle, you're not here to struggle in frustration as a hater. You are here to struggle to live for purpose. And what is purpose that we have experienced, that we've labeled as human beings, every human being that you will ever find, that you ask the question, have you found purpose? And they say yes. And you say, what was that? They say love. That's the purpose. That is it. That is all we are all struggling for. And I love this 2838, this perseverance through the struggle to love. And so out there in the world, we hear, this is going back to, hi Liz, by the way, we were, we're talking about trauma and conditioning and living in the body and learning to recognize what is conditioning, what is trauma and what is body mechanics. And so there's uh, some PDFs that I'm going to offer uh, to be able to track some things and notice some things. But what Nancy was just uh, referring to was that place that we arrive to once we've been deconditioned to the point where we can watch our conditioning and we can watch our suffering and our maladaptive behaviors and still be in our signature about it. You are still very satisfied when you are wrong or you are very satisfied when you are uh, angry or unregulated or whatever, or blissful or orgasmic, you are just satisfied. And you are finding that space where the body leads you into all of your satisfaction. And then your brain gets to giggle about it and bring us that beautiful 4323 six line. Uh, you know, I don't care if you're angry or happy, just be who you are expression that we all are needing. And I think that what you said was so beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the other piece with undefined G that I also noticed for this week was, uh, it's just a very, like a very mundane kind of life. I wanted to have this, I can't drink coffee, but I like the form, the fluffy form on yeah. top with cappuccino and latte. And I tried all kinds of machine. I bought all different machines trying to make it exactly as a coffee shop. I said, then why don't I just go down to the coffee shop, get it? And, and then I just do all the things around it, trying to do it myself. Then I realized, huh, isn't that what my undefined G has been doing? Playing all this strategy to be loved. And I learned all the strategy to be loved. And then come to a place of, huh, okay, I've done it and I can just love too. <laughs> I, I can just be in the place of love too. So it's really interesting. It's also okay for me to be conditioned too. Yeah. It's also okay to be healthily conditioned. Hey, I really love the coffee you make. Let let you let you give me. I'm open to, for you to give me the love. It's okay. And so it, it's such a funny joke. And also for undefined ego, I realized the reason I'm I'm getting all these unnecessary things is because I never really stay true to the thing that I really want. Like I always compromising the 
really needed number one because I go with number two, three, four, five. And all the way around, I still coming back. I need to be number one. <laughs> so what's the point? But it's it's fun to go through this journey. Yeah. Until you see the end of the tunnel, it's just for yourself. They are waiting for you. <laughs> yes. It can be fun when you're not being bruised with expectations about the way you should show up in all of these places. That's what gives us all of these bruises is that, is that exactly. And so this being able to marry your mind and your body does not bring, like you say, it brings a very mundane life. It's really funny that you, you know, you still chop the wood and carry the water. Nothing changes nothing changes, but you get to have awareness. And so then you get to giggle. Like that is what I've seen the very root of it all working with somebody and they realize what you just realized, Nancy, or what you have been realizing. And there's nothing left to do except to giggle because it's so funny the way that it's all put together. But it takes a while to get there. And I wonder, Nancy, um, when, well, what did it feel like as an undefined G? What did it feel like when you recognized that you were seeking for love? What was that body? What did your body do? Did you recognize a movement or a, or a, or a something that your body, a cue that your body gave you when you were seeking for love instead of just experiencing what existed as love? Hmm. I feel there is two ways. One is often until it happens, until there is something injected in me, I feel this difference when I'm alone. Also with the wise flea, with undefined G's. Oh, when the love is here, or someone with a defined G here, I really can feel this completeness. There is energetical shift. There is, I would call it the hotness in the Dantian, the the, the sacral, there's something in the stern, just there was this like digestive check it was used to be all over the place. Now it whoop, comes to the middle and that's it. <laughs> that's just one energy. I was like, mm, okay, I know. And there is a certainty about direction. Like under evangel, I, I normally don't. Disorientation was the common thing. That's one is until it happens, I notice a difference. And the difference is when the thing is gone, that person is gone. Ah. Oh, there is a sense of sucking out. There is a sense there is no sugar in my cup. Oops, that's the part I need to digest. So that's the second part is there is this, I'm not say unhealthy, but rather than I notice the melancholy mm -hmm. as part of the playing the sentimentality. Oh, it's like, oh, I'm lonely. Oh, I'm not being loved. The, the whole story, when I goes back to my childhood story, I using them to validate me. Then that's where I thought, okay, if I have those sorts of the world just doesn't love me and all these kind of beliefs that is to do with my childhood thing, mm -hmm. that place when I'm just too bored, when there's no stimulation for, for the undefined G, then I need to find something. Yeah, that yeah. openness, that stimulation, that's what I will say, yeah. Oh, one more question, is if that's okay. And it is, if you were to give me like an interpretive dance or a, what would your body, what would that, what did you recognize or did you, what was your body doing when you were playing the stories of your childhood after they had left and you had felt empty again and the stories came, what did that look like? Hmm. Hmm. The moment you're mentioning the exact image it comes in is like, I'm contracted, I'm, I'm naked, the whole body naked in a cave, like very dark room, there's nothing, no access. And I'm just hidden in the corner, in the corner, while the outside of the room was just glamorous and partying, mm. and I was just trapped in the corner of the dark room. And it's really interesting for me, it was like, no one approached it. It's like the, this little child figure, fragile, but there is this self-pity game, you mm -hmm. can see, playing the people just inviting her to out but she just want to be there in their state yeah. there is so much attachment to it <laughs> attachment to be i can be special if i'm the only one that is missing so that everyone can remember i'm not in it so that everyone everyone will be talking about me so there is this game that i was playing to be unique and special so people remember so people will love me <laughs> you know by missing by me being missing right, people right. remember me to wanted to love me <laughs> yeah. yeah and then i can play the second like the resisting game yes i come with you no i don't come with you you know yeah. this, and game. <laughs> this open ego says i am important and you will come find me and prove it yes <laughs> 
Oh, what brilliance you have uh, connected to that body that I mean, I'd love when we can express ourselves in this way and say, oh, this is what happens. Then the next time Nancy feels as if she's in this dark corner, her body starts doing this thing again. Now her mind has the experience to draw from and say, hey, baby girl, is that this? You all right? And and are you looking for attention? Nancy, I remember I, I, I used to do the same thing in relationship where I would withhold my love because you will come back and you will come get it from me. And, and because you don't deserve it anymore because you have done something that offended me. But gosh forbid, I come to you and tell you that I'm hurt or confront my feelings. I would just remove my love and it would be the proof that you were hurting me or whatever. You know, oh, it's just this terrible thing that happens. But once we're able to, to see it and accept it and fall in love with it, it's still, it doesn't, it's not as if it never happens again. So I want to make that clear for all of us. It's not as if these patterns, these spirals that we have going on in us end because we become aware of them. No, they actually become amusing. They become the thing that makes us giggle when we're like, oh shit, here I'm doing it again, I'm removing my love. And then I go back and I give more love than I would have given in the first place because I was like, ah, this is funny. Let me just pour myself on this because that's what I want to do now. Once I realized that I had been withholding for this game of attention, um, this is such a beautiful conversation that is not always had, that is so important to have. And then the things that you also said is the acceptance, man, the pure acceptance of your mechanics, watching them work without judgment is this, this, this body tracking is part of that. It's not just knowing intellectually all this knowledge about your design. You can know it all day, but until your knowing falls into your body, allowing it to exist, you're not even experimenting, in my opinion. You're just still in the mind about it. This And, and once you allow that mechanic to exist, and that mechanic exists. So let me say one of, I have a fully defined ego, uh, 26 twice, 40, 51 twice, um, and 21. Almost all in the fourth line. Um, what that means for me, why I said it that way, um, is because this means that I am here to prove shit, um, and to get an exchange for it at its very basic fundamental level in my upbringing, that is wrong and bad and shameful. And so there was this moment that I remembered that every time I went to ask for, uh, a, a, an exchange, ugh, to get taken care of at all, to take care of myself in exchange, I would show up, you know, head down, eyes averted. Is this okay? Is this okay? Is that okay? Instead of showing up and saying, I will fucking rock your world and it costs $50 or $200 or two, you know, whatever it is. Instead of being firm, I could see the trauma, the bad, wrong, and shameful. And so the first couple of times I could see that, I was a little victim-y about it. I was like, oh, I shouldn't be like this. Why does the world do this to me? You know, as that second line body going into the victim place, I think that that's something that we do very naturally and first and then we're able to naturally move ourselves out of that and see that, uh, oh, I can do something about this now. But it took a while. It took a little while of my of continuing to document what was happening to be able to then show up and say, okay, well, I'm going to be afraid and I'm still going to do this. And I will rock your world and it will be this much. And I kept my eyes open this way, right? So I went from hypo like depressive, like, is this okay? To oh, now I'm over the top with it. And now I'm, my ego is too much. So there's this, but this isn't anything that I've ever done wrong. This is the game, the mythology, the story. This is my book. This is what Brandy is here to have put into the Akashic record is this quest, this journey. And so when we can see our designs that way and we can speak of them like Nancy did and, and like I am, like of the myth mythology that our biology is here to live within, we can allow that trauma to live without the victim stories. But we've got to put our eyes on it. And I know that it's the thing that everybody hates to do. You know, nobody wants to work on themselves necessarily or get into those deep, dark places because they're afraid of them. But I'm here to tell you 
there's a process and a way to get into those deep, dark places without being afraid of them. And I think, Nancy, you shared that beautifully. Um, what I also got from your share is that you allow your inner child to continue to exist, right? We are not taking our inner children and telling them that they're bad, wrong, and shameful and they need to change because <laughs> that's what a lot of us do sometimes. <laughs> we, you know, in a lot, we, we allow her to exist and then we say, okay, well, you can't exist like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Brandy, that part, I can really see that exists all the time in a way. The trauma for me is mostly to do with if I feel being rejected, my gate 19, the fear of rejection, even just people sending me attacks or the fear of confrontation or conflict, I just detect something that angry at me. So this little child of my mother is angry with me. And I thought there was there's so much from time to time this episode. Even I don't live with, with my mother in the same city. And she sent me some text, which might share with me, oh, I fell down from chair yesterday. And then she just, she didn't tell me there is something wrong with me, but I wasn't there. So I will come up with this story. Oh, she might be angry with me. And then I will stay for a few days to feel very uncomfortable. My body will feel like the cone is on my back and this bloating in the front and this hype, like this frightening, this fear. And in, even in my adult body and until a few days, like I would say three days, to feel uncomfortable, couldn't sleep well. Until one day I wake up, I look at the sky, but I just saw the cloud just flying. And I just thought, nothing is really happening, Nancy. There is a whisper from my sleep, <laughs> like someone, nothing's really happening. This is just your drama. Not, no one is doing this to you. You are just dramatizing it. And I thought, yeah, nothing is really happening. It's still okay. I'm still alive. I'm breathing. So I just laugh at myself. I see myself playing this drama. No one is hating you. No one is rejecting you. Maybe they can be angry, but it has nothing to do with you too. So it's really interesting that my body, mm -hmm. uh, vulnerably, it just goes into this reactive mode of, oh, frightened and holding the breath and uncertain, unstable for a few days. And then it's okay. So yeah, it's- um, How beautiful. How do you parent yourself in those three days? I can't, I can't do anything. Like when I say I can't, it means- the struggler side of me likes to struggle, like to find story to struggle. The struggle is for bad too. So that struggling feels like, okay, intense. I can meet this intensity. I can meet, meet this emotionality. Uh -huh. I don't try to use another meditative story or other way to run away from it because my experience told me I just go until I'm so exhausted and I stop fighting <laughs> and mm -hmm. then I see the truth. <laughs> it's just until that moment. I struggle enough, I feel like, okay, done. I've done, and this is not worthwhile. And it's not even real. <laughs> There's just always that moment for struggler. Yeah. yeah. But I guess it's different for everyone. If you don't have the struggling channel, maybe, and I need a concentrated struggling, like concentrated tear, concentrated few days. Okay, this is a drama again, but it's okay because they release some part of the I would say emotional traumas that can be in my body. The fluid can get flow. The childhood story can revisit again. And every time when I revisit those childhood moments, I thought, Nancy, didn't I just do this therapy a hundred times already? What's yeah. new here? I'm so bored with this. And then surprise me, there's always some layers in it. Just a different, it's the same truth, but different a uh, new release. At a cell, cellular level, yeah. Yes. And so I wanted to mention that and actually talk a little bit about that in the science. So I'm going to bring the scientific into this. We're, we're really in the void of the feminine emotional field. And sometimes that can get a little, we can get a little lost there. So I want to bring us back to this scientific truth and remind us all that we are 67 trillion vibrating particles of light. And those little particles of light, let's just imagine that they are filled with water. Uh, so let's say your cells are water, right? 80% of your body is water. And it vibrates with the your beliefs, the frequency of your beliefs. And so 
these 67 trillion vibrating particles of light vibrate with your beliefs. You have been creating or collapsing the wave function of a certain belief since you were a child. And so what that does doing that over and over and over and over again is it really solidifies or hardens what is in our bodies. It solidifies that frequency to where now that frequency is also emitting. And so what we're doing by, by arriving and bringing that energy from our minds, knowing into our body's feeling is interrupting the vibration that you have been vibrating at this whole time. So we go into it with a new set of eyes, a new frequency, and we change it only this much only this much. We're just tink. And just like music changes water in the science of cymatics, if you put a speaker underwater very specifically, it will make a geometry. That is what's happening in your body. But once you take that frequency away, the water goes back to its old vibration. But you put it back and it vibrates with a new geometry and then you move it away and it goes back. This is what's happening in our body. So every time we allow our knowing to exist in our body, we follow our strategy and authority into this place, and then we get another frequency, we then get to allow it to shift us over and over with this new belief because we had the same experience. So it brought up that frequency again. Now we penetrate it just a little bit. The science behind evolution is a long story. <laughs> it takes a really long time to change the frequency expression of biology. I mean, think about how many millions of years it took to go from Neanderthal to Homo sapien, now to us, to go from fish to land animal, to go from mycelium to tree. It takes forever. We are doing that and we are just doing it drop by drop. But the great news that we have is that we can watch it like a movie. And I'm still trying to articulate this properly, but I want to offer this as well to remember that, you know, we are always telling stories. We're writing books. We are creating art. We're creating music. We're making movies and sequels to the same movie over and over and over again. Um, we are uh, calling up our friends and family, telling them the stories of what our life has been. Um, we are telling it to each other here, sitting here now. We look in the mirror and tell stories. We are doing nothing but but telling stories, every all of us are. We are all living or telling a story. And evolution is the path of being aware of what story you're telling. And so this trauma is the thing that is 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 forced us to not know the story we're telling. And then the prana of coming back out and and realizing that there was trauma is then telling another story is then actually telling the full story why did i say it that way i i think the bottom line is is that if we are telling stories let's tell ones that feel good and so anytime you are telling yourself or someone else a story that lowers your frequency, it is because you have a belief system or a trauma that is still vibrating the water in your body. And you want to match that frequency with your experience. So you tell a story that feels bad so that this thing in your body can get its renewal of feel bad. Um, but there are ways to recognize it. And that's what I wanted to give today is, 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 uh, I want, I want to talk some more, maybe Liz or pockets or Marissa, um, talk some more uh, about how trauma felt in your body. That's not the question. Rewind. The question is, when did you remember realizing that you weren't fully in the body? What is it that your body does? Have you recognized when it feels traumatized or when it feels as if it cannot follow its knowing? 
let's bring to your mind. The reason I'm asking this is because we're going to put our mind on that so our mind can get to work because our mind always wants to make it better. Our mind can get to work doing that. Our mind can become our ally. And what I mean by making it better is showing you when you're doing a trauma response rather than uh, an authority response. Okay, so I'm going to go back to the question again. Do you remember when you got into your body? Anyone? Do you remember that day where it was like, oh, here I am. This is a trauma or this is my authority. Can you recognize that? Pockets? I have a, a moment. It, it's not really a trauma, but it's like the moment that I realized my my mind and my body were different. It was after starting HD and I was in my kitchen and I was hungry. And so I made, there was macaroni and cheese in the house, the kind that I always liked. It's what I always ate. I made it. I was so excited. I was so hungry. And I finished stirring the cheese into whatever the little box macaroni was. And I stood over it and I smelled it. And I said, uh-uh. And I was like, oh, <laughs> but I'm hungry. I'm definitely hungry, but this is not. And I so thought that that was what I wanted to eat. And um, so it's little, little things like that for me that are like, wait a minute, you don't really know. Whenever I say what I don't, whenever my response is what I don't think it's going to be, it's like a little reminder that there's there's some disconnect here okay, so let's listen to what the body really wants, which was not macaroni and cheese. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, but yeah, it just, that's, so I'm, I'm still working on that. That's still a path for me that I'm on. Um, but. So if we said, uh, um, if we made that macaroni and cheese something else, like, um, let me say it another way. I know we've talked about this before and I want to do it for benefit of everybody. Mm -hmm. um, if that macaroni and cheese were say, oh, I don't want macaroni and cheese. If it were, oh, I don't want to feed my children today. Mm -hmm. What does the body do then? Mm. Mm. Tightness in the stomach is what came to me. Um, yeah, because you believe what I'm supposed to do that every day and I'm a bad mom if I don't. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so you can go back to that. I mean, this is a, this is something that seems like a no brainer for all of us here on the call that that would be, well, I'm not a bad mom, but that is a, we've come down to pockets. This is more ancestral for you. You've come down to the bottom of it. Like, okay, I don't have to feed my kids. My kids can feed themselves because I have been a proper yeah. mother to show them the cabinets and to put food in them. You know, this is not my mm -hmm. task if I don't want it. And you've mm -hmm. gotten to that, but then you mm -hmm. still feel it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we've gotten to, I, I, I'm bringing this to the surface so that we can understand you guys. We are not fixing anything. We are learning to watch and do our part to transmute the things that were not true that we have inherited. This mm -hmm. belief in your body is not just yours, Pockets. It's every mother's that ever has been in a famine and they've watched their children die. We get to remember those things and come back to, I am not there. This is not this. They've experienced that. I am here. My children are happy. My And we get to then nurture and reparent ourselves. Mm-hmm. Because that frequency, that experience, I, I remember, at least for myself, uh, I'll, I'll share an experience that I had with the mothering. You know, I have processed my children. I have four children. They're all adults. Um, and they I have processed their deaths over and over and over again mm -hmm. as a process, as a as a coping, as a as a healing mechanism for all of the things that I think that I'm still responsible for as their mother. Mm -hmm. And what if that didn't happen? What if they didn't have that thing? What if they, what if they, what if they all the way to what if they died? And what does that mean about me? 
And what did I'm bad? I'm wrong. I'm shame. I'm that, you know, working myself all the way down to there's nothing I should do. There is only what I am designed to do. And I know that through tapping into my body. And I know that my children are going to live exactly the mythology that they need to live. And the best thing that I can do to parent them is to be the fullest expression of my own mythology and not the codependent mother that takes care of them. My my point is, I'm getting off on tangents, but I think my point is we uh, we get to confront shockingly these these things, these things that make our belly tight, because when they make our belly tight and we just sit with the tightness, remember what I said about we're 67 billion trillion frequent uh, vibrating particles of light. And so when your belly's tight, you're not vibrating at a rate that supports life. You are vibrating at a slower rate. And so that slower rate allows calcification, if you imagine it that way, allows coagulation of energy, of frequencies. Mm -hmm. When frequencies mm -hmm. coagulate, they create chaos in the system. Mm -hmm. So we get to fall into the belly and say, oh, there is tightness in my belly. Tightness, what do you want to say to me? I mean, what I talk to it like it's a seven-year-old. Oh, well, I want to tell you that you're wrong for not feeding your children. Oh, I know that you think that I'm wrong because there have been times where there has been terrible famine and mothers and fathers could not feed their children and, and I can, and there's food in the fridge and I'm not doing it. It doesn't mean I'm bad or wrong because we're not in those times anymore, right? And you have this conversation like it's a seven-year-old with the seven-year-old of a tight stomach. Mm -hmm. And this is, is um, then we can reprogram. This is how you reprogram the lexicon, the belief system that's in your mind is by addressing and seeing, putting your eyes on each and every one of the beliefs that you hold. And you will fall deeper and deeper into your body. I think that's the whole message I wanted to impart today is that we get this human design wisdom and we fill our brains with it. And then we get so frustrated, not just human design wisdom. We've all, if we're here at the human design system, we've been through a lot of systems, pretty much all of us. So all of these systems and things that we've crammed into our brain and we think we know something, but we obviously don't because we're still here trying to find something. So this is the point where I'm inviting you to arrive exactly where you're at and stop trying to use your mind to find more, but use your mind to let all of that brilliance that you have collected have an experience through your body. And, ha and the first barrier to that is your trauma. Once, or belief systems. Uh, Liz, I classified trauma not as, I mean, we don't have to, it can be all the way from violence to, you know, a stubbed toe, but I imagine it like a banana, right? You take your fresh banana off the counter and you throw it in your purse because you're going to eat it later in the day. You pull it out in the afternoon and it's got some bruises on it. You're like, wow, okay. Well, it's not that it was inherently wrong or that anybody did anything to it. It's just that the nature of life put some little bruises on it. This is trauma. Change the biological structure of its nature by bruising it a little, just the experience of the world. This is what we're here doing. And so these bruises that I'm talking about are the things that keep us from following our strategy and authority. We are always in this process, I call it, of evolution and involution. This is that star of David. This is the upward triangle and the downward triangle. We are always and at all times evolving, becoming more aware and at the same time that that awareness is happening, we have to allow it to involute and to come inside of our experience. We have to allow both of those. And what we get stuck, what I see, I need perspective. I see what my community needs. And I said earlier, I'm a fully defined ego, all line four, so I will show up. And this is what I see that some of us in our communities we show up and we keep talking about all of this and we keep being so wise and smart about every gate and line and variable and this and that and, and they must be and that must be and this must, all of that means nothing 
unless we are able to evolve and involve ourselves in ourselves, right? Not just know it, but let that knowing have an experience in the body. And the reason that people in our community don't let it have an experience in their body is because it's really fucking scary to get in there sometimes. I get it. I get it. And we're not all designed to be warriors in that way, but some of us are. And so I want to give some tools. And so um, I think that when we can have the experience of our design within our body, we realize at such a deep level that none of us are doing this on purpose. So we stop looking at the other and say, oh, well, maybe it's because of this and that and the other. And maybe it's because of this and that and the other. And we're always trying to this and that and the other each other. We're always trying to because each other. It's not even about that. It's about becoming allies and linking arms and being like, oh, shit, look at your ride. Oh, here's my ride. Oh, my gosh, look at your ride. But linking arms so that none of us fall. Yeah. Thank you, Pockets, for, for sharing and for being here and for your heart staying rhythmic as it needed to. Thank you. Ah, oh, Liz or Marissa, I'd love to hear what's alive in you. Yeah, I um I love that question of, you know, where did I feel the difference in my body? I can't remember how you asked it, but um, you know, there was one moment. Well, it was it was a number of moments, but like one big life thing that happened where I I left the religion I grew up in and, and it was this really traumatic thing. And I threw out all of the, everything I knew, all of my intuition along with it, you know, and then coming back to this place of like, what do I know? What is true? Um, I got really deep into meditation and I meditated daily 20 minutes, twice a day. And it was in those moments that I got so in my body and all of the meaning and stories and trying to sort out what was handed to me and what did I actually know and all of that just like didn't matter. And I just had this like really embodied knowing that, um, essentially the answer, the thing that was true that I knew or didn't even know, like the thing that I felt was that, like, I don't know the words, but it's essentially like the universe is good. It's for me. Mm -hmm. And just this deep sense of peace and just this like really just delicious feeling in my body, you know? And ever since that now I have that to look back to and whenever everything gets confusing in my mind whenever um gate 61 is in the transit I go it it activates that channel for me and I'm like why what's the truth what's the answer and I can just go back to that knowing you know and um and it's just such a great reference point but it's so I love this topic so much I was talking to my friend today who's going through she's an emotional manifesting generator and recently ended a 6 year relationship and so there's all this stuff going on for her and and my line 4 loves to just be there with her in it all you know and she was talking today about going to this basketball game tonight where she might see her ex with his girlfriend and the stuff it was bringing up for her and it really had me in this question of you know as a generator and checking in it, it, if it's a yes or a no like I also have my husband in this program right now where he's um it's like OCD and anxiety treatment and and they focus so much on sort of deciphering out the part of the brain that is not healthy for them. The part that is like, avoid anything scary, avoid it, avoid it, neutralize it, get away from it. And how the way to heal that is to go towards the things that are scary. So I've really been looking at this, like 
how to tell which, because all of us do that. You know, we all do that to a degree. And so for my friend, it was really clear. It was like, go to the basketball game. You'll go there You'll and hopefully you'll see him with the girlfriend and it will take away this huge fear where if you don't go and you avoid it, then it tells you you couldn't have handled it and you get that, you know, lesson kind of thing. And so I've really been looking at that and how it relates to trauma. And then it had me go back to like, seeing these things in myself. And she was saying, she's like, I don't even want to be with this guy ever again, but I want all of the guys to want me and I want to be in control. Yes. You know, and I saw how much I do this. I was like, yes. And, and she's a, she's a three, five, she has um, six, five in her incarnation cross. So she's supposed to be seducing and, you know, and this is her mechanic is she's supposed to seduce people and she does this to me she does it to everybody she gets she draws us out of our mundane lives for adventure and it's what we love about her and it is the value she is yeah and I see for me that like it was so interesting just like before any of this discussion I was thinking about this and how I um when I was growing up I was in this neighborhood with all these boys and they were bullies like they were mean and they did usually they would just make fun of us and whatever, but they like, there were some like traumatic things. And then as I got to be a teenager and got to be attractive and desirable to them, they were all nice to me and they all started taking care of me. And, and I've seen these fears come up of like, I'm getting old, like I'm getting wrinkles and I'm getting age spots and whatever. And my hair is getting thin. Am are they going to start bullying me again? Are they going to stop taking care of me and start bullying me? And it's really like, it's been so, cause I don't like to think I'm vain, but I think like there's a huge importance I put on how I look because I mean, it really was. And it's also in my mechanics where I'm a four, all of my opportunities have come from people who were attracted to me for whatever, you know, like this is how we, create our relationships and our opportunities. And so it's just been so interesting to see, just like you said, the story. Um, and then like, what is the mechanics? Mm -hmm. And I just like watch the thing and be like, okay, like I survived the childhood. I'll probably survive when I'm older and less of what men desire, you know, like I'll be okay. But it's like, it's been really interesting to watch that. So I love, I love this whole discussion, but I especially love that point to look back to like, when did I see that distinction in my body and what my body told me versus what my mind was spinning off? Cause that is kind of that, like that, um, compass, that thing that I always come back to or need to remember to come back to, like, that's the thing for me too. And that's the threshold to walk through each time to look for. And I, and I want to remind us all, I want to go into a little shamanic space or a little ancestral space and remind us all, because I've heard this a couple of times um, and you talking about your friend and us being, uh, you know, having uh, female blood, yin blood, um, historically have not been taken care of when we are old. I was just reading just this morning. Uh, about the Wild West and about the sex workers of the parlors in the Wild West and how uh, this relegation to poverty and to these places where they would go and live that I didn't even know about. I was just reading this historic account that these women, once they got older and not desirable, had to go live somewhere else in mm -hmm. poverty. So this, I want to invite us all to remember that these wounds, these things that we're going through, I want to invite you to get higher than your own life. I want to invite you to know that you seduce people so that you're not burnt. Your friend, your fifth line friend seduces people so that she's not burnt because either she's the general or the savior, right? So, and, and that burning is the thing. I want to remind us all that we are here doing work, uh, our job. The only reason this biology exists is to change the frequency that existed before. No judgment, not bad, wrong, or shameful. It's just to to adjust or restory, tell a different story than has been told before. And we know what it's like to be burnt at the stake. So we know how to deal with those odds. Mm -hmm. We don't necessarily know what it's like to not be burnt at the stake and be ourselves. And that's what fear is. That's what we're here changing. We are here taking the, I am getting gray and I've got age marks and oh shit, look at these wrinkles. Gosh, when I look down at my phone and I see all this, I'm like, what in the world? 
And all of that is me working through not having to go live in poverty because I'm not valuable anymore. So I want to go all the way down to the crux of it. And I want to teach us all to go to the crux of it because then we stop pussyfooting around with all the other stuff. Because it's not about any of that other stuff. It's really about changing the frequency that already existed into a new story. Mm. Oh, thank you for sharing that. Thank you for bringing that to the table. It is so relevant, not just for women, but for men that age and for, you know, many, many different things. We're all, we're all doing this work. And when we can know that it's not personal, even though it feels so personal, it has to feel personal in order for us to do the work. But to know it's not, <laughs> to take that eagle-eyes view while still allowing yourself to be a mouse in the mix of it, but knowing that this also exists. This is the dichotomy between 17 and 18 right now, alive in the field, I think, <laughs> is to, you know, 18 is the correction, correction. It's all got to be fixed. 17 is the opinion. But when we're farsighted, we can see why the things are the way they are and know when proper action is needed for correction in the moment by keeping the eagle eyes view. Mm. That's 17 and 18 are both in my incarnation cross. So it's like, oh, uh huh. to, because I, because what pulls me in is I want to correct the individual, like the thing right here. And, it, and it's like, so I so need that reminder of like, the big picture, it's a collective line. It's not an individual, you know, right. and it's stuff like I judge myself and want to, you know, perfect myself. And so oh. that's so good. Yeah. We, we never want to turn those projected channels in on ourselves, guys. <laughs> it will never do us any good. <laughs> yeah. It's such a beautiful share. Thank you. Thank you for Thank you. being so vulnerable. Yeah. Thank you for the space. Yeah. It feels very safe and very, very nourishing. And I love the linking arms on our rides. That's so beautiful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's what we're doing here is just linking arms. <sighs> um, I know you are at the office, Marissa, but I just wanted to give you another opportunity if you wanted to chime in before we go. Oh, she said one sec. Okay, good. Okay, good. Oh, what else? I'm going to show real quick. I'm going to show you, Liz, uh, the things that we went over, and I'm going to put these in the uh, chat in Discord. Um, just there's a couple experience logs in here to where if you wanted to use them, use them. But if you just want to see the format and make your own on a spreadsheet, do that or whatever, however you want to do it. And even if you don't want to do it, that's cool. But um, the day, how your body feels, what the senses are, what the story is, and any notes that you have. Um, I invited us all to track for the next two weeks um, our body checklists. This first tool, 18, is just what what are your what is your body doing? Let's just get to know our body. Let's just see what our body is doing. Here are some things that are that that we're feeding our mind, because uh, I like to talk about the mind and the body, like the male and the female, like the husband and the wife. Right? We are just giving the husband some things to watch out for in our bodies, in the wife's body. You know, if the wife does this, this is what she means. You know, so that's what I'm giving you here. So I want you to have this conversation to see what she does. Let him see what she does. And then after we do that, we'll move into trauma cues because once you can put your baseline, what does your body do? What does she do? What are your mechanics? Then we can see when your body changes from those mechanics, this is where your bruise is. This is where the trauma is. And then here are some cues after you've gotten your baseline to recognize, to, to tell him to look for, to say, oh, there's a belief here that gets to be addressed. So there's some list there for that. Um, and then there's just tracking. There's more, you know, more detailed. I identify a body part you want to learn about, you know, uh, if I'm having an ailment, you know, with something, I would put that in here and I would pay attention to it for a long time. And I would talk about, you know, what I felt about this. And if I had an ailment, because what we know to be true about ailments 
is that they are um, just an upregulation or a downregulation of a belief in your body. So your brain has all the pharmacology it needs to keep you as healthy as a five-year-old forever and ever. Amen. But we have beliefs that stop it from giving us that pharmacology. From, from from allowing that chemistry to be in existence. What governs that? Our DNA. Our DNA and RNA play together to be able to upregulate different things, hormones, expressions of who we are in our body. What was the point? I keep I keep losing the trail. Hold on. I lost it. So I'm going to let it go. I think what I was trying to point to was this was epigenetic changes in our bodies. When we put our attention on a piece of our body, um, our attention alone is the thing that is needed to change it. That's it. No tools, no anything. Our attention alone. A story only wants to be told. Remember, you are always a story. Whether you're speaking it or moving it or living it, you are always a story. So the story wants to be told. The story wants an audience. The story wants to be seen. A story is not a story until it's seen. Your body, when it's speaking to you, it's it just wants to be seen. Your seeing is the alchemy. So if there's any ailments in the body, let's just see them. Let's just put our attention on them. And let our attention with our knowing be on them in a way. Let me give you an example. Be on, it, I When I was um, moving through anaphylactic shock and lupus and all of these things that I was moving through, I educated my mind fully on everything that I could know on how to rebuild my immune system. I didn't educate myself on autoimmune disease. I educated myself on how with peptides and amino acids is an immune system rebuilt. That's the story I told my body is this is what we can do now. I didn't read the forums that said autoimmune disease means that you're going to die within five years or you've got to do this or you've got to do that or you've got to... those stories have already been told. We know those stories. I'm going to tell a new story. I'm going to tell my story. And my story was, this is how an autoimmune disease is healed in a body. And this is the pharmacology that's needed in order to heal that autoimmune disease. And I didn't know that my body would do it, but I had a belief and I held it and I held it. And I put my sight on that story every day in meditation for a few hours. I watched my immune system build itself back up in this imaginary idea of it being possible. And it did. So what I'm saying is we got to see it. We got to see every little part of our body. We got to see every little joint and crevice and crack that we have shoved something tender into because we didn't want to tell the story and we didn't want to see the story. We've got to revisit all of those tender little places. And once we do, we giggle. I mean, that's just the end of it. <laughs> There's nothing left to do but to giggle. Uh, so I think that's what I wanted to share. Marissa, I hope I didn't uh, go too long. Oh, no, you're good. <laughs> okay, good. I just wanted to get into a quiet room. Um, appreciate all of that, everything. I'm so glad I still tuned in regardless. There's been so much uh, today that's just blown me away and re relate to on a lot of levels. And um, uh, what came up for me when you're asking these questions is like I... I, maybe I'm not connected or something like I don't know that I'm noticing it as much in the moment um as much as like a little bit later <laughs> I'm like oh shoot there was that thing or I realized that this was not congruent my body and my mind were not congruent um but at the same time it's a more like uh it was a a process for me, I feel like. Um, and and I think of the way, like, when I first met HD or how I feel like I came to meet human design and timely 
uh, enough. It was um, started with the last solar eclipse, um, but I, I made it a point to go out and see it, and um, and it rocked my body. Like I, it, <laughs> I felt. I stayed, I put my glasses off for longer than they said. And I like watched the whole diamond ring, like just reach out to me and just like, just pierce my G. Like I just felt it in my chest. And I didn't even, you know, at the time, I didn't know what was going on, but I just felt it brought me to my knees, literally. And it was like, I mean, I don't know if I've had a Kundalini experience either, but I felt this like fire go up and down my body. And I was like, I'm changed. I'm changed, you know, and and so I didn't know what that meant. I just felt something so strong, and then, be, not too long before that, um, uh, you know, I was feeling really down. I've really struggled with my weight over the years. I have the thirty-nine <laughs> under uh, open solar plexus and stuff like that. Like, um, it's been up and down a lot of times, and I was really in probably probably my heaviest at the time and I was really unhappy with my body and I knew I couldn't feel anything you know and that I was just trying to drown out all the pain that I was dealing with and um, um and it was not too long after um the eclipse that uh someone had brought up intermittent fasting to me and I was like, oh, well, that's interesting idea. And I was like, I do notice like, oh yeah, I don't, I'm not really that hungry till later on in the day and this and that. And it's like, that could work. But I didn't like ask a ton of questions, which is normally what I would do, you know, like in transference. I'm like, find out this, find out that. Who did this? Who did that? What does this mean? Blah, blah, blah. But I was just like, okay, I'll just sit with that. And And then I was like, you know what? I just think before I even say I'm I'm going on this quest to lose weight or I'm gonna go on this quest to like fix my body. I'm like, let me just watch what I do. And I literally spent six months just watching like when do I feel hungry? When do I like like all of these things of like uh when do I feel the most sluggish? When when do I feel like I need to stuff my face with sugar or, or carbs or something like that? And I just watched it and naturally I already slowed down um, my my um, eating or like I was starting to eat less and less and um, just taking some other things out. Like I was I already knew that my body struggled with alcohol. I've never been a heavy drinker because my body just can't take it. Like it'll, it, I could have two drinks and it, I'm vomiting. <laughs> I'm allergic. So I was like, that's easy to get rid of. No more alcohol, you know, like that'll help less calorie. You know, I was just doing all these things. and and then I was like, today I'm going to start doing the fat, you know, like be a little bit more specific about, you know, timing and things like that. And it, and I noticed too, I'm like, hey, I'm not hung up in, on like, oh my God, I didn't, I had 200 more calories than I should have. Because I also noticed that too. That was what I knew going into. I was like, I don't want to do what I've always done where I'm eating things that I don't like, where I'm restricting calories, but <laughs> when I really want this, or like my mind is so preoccupied with, you know, calorie counting or this or this or that. And then I don't really feel like I'm otherwise living. And, and so I wanted to see how that was. And, um, and so then I started, um, coincidentally I think it was probably you know probably around the 41 you know probably the start of the new year because then just a couple weeks later I discovered HD and I was like wow this is amazing and then as like the weight was coming off and this feeling of being more like I never felt more in my body in my entire life like in my entire life it just was it just was that way and and then within a couple a uh, month I found out about um, my PHS and I'm like oh my gosh I, that's what I'm kind of, that's exactly what I've been doing or the way like the way when I've been eating it's like yeah I'm getting up walking around hey I'm gonna stand up at my desk I'm not gonna just be sitting all the time like I had started doing that and I'm like oh my gosh this is I was already how did I how did I know you know like that was kind of amazing to me and so then I even uh leaned into it even more like oh the butt you know my 
mind doesn't need as much food or it's like, okay, let me try eating information, you know, like let me try eating, learning more about HD, learning more about myself so that it can get processed in that bot in the body and like just really get in deep on where I'm where I'm um again following my my strategy and my PHS, um, that it'll feel more encompassed and um fulfilled and it and it did. I just took off like like my my energy level was much more consistent and sustained. I felt more comfortable um talking to people and think like I wasn't as like, oh I gotta be a hermit hide myself because I'm, I don't feel comfortable in my body. I don't want anyone to see me, you know? Um, and um, I just really, I think at that time I was really blooming, especially. And, um, and that's always kind of stuck with me in terms of um, just um, paying attention, like just stopping and just watching what happened, just watching what I do. And then, go from there instead of um, coming up with my own <laughs> mental strategies of how to get the love I want, how to look the way I want, how to do all these things and just be content with mm -hmm. the, the mechanics of my body. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> There's a few things that I want to reflect upon about, well, you're a reflector. So the process <laughs> is so much different um as the as the program moves around the wheel it activates who you are and then you must go through that process over and over and over again to get a real sense of the the who that you are right and then the who that you're not so i the reflectors that i have uh worked with and grown with um uh, have shared with me that there is, there is, there is the program in their body. There is the conditioning of the person that's in front of them in their body. There is their conditioning in their body and there is who they are in their body. <laughs> and so <laughs> yeah. it takes such a long time. I noticed for the reflectors in my life to move through and to Put their brain remember this is a process of becoming aware we have never not been who we are if you ask your parents back when you were just born and unable to be anything but yourself you were probably following your phs perfectly you were being a reflector you were waiting a long time to decide things you were doing exactly because you can never not be who you are you are never not that you are just putting things in the way of being that mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Yes. So these things for you that are in the way are, you know, you get to, you get the beautiful um, gift if you decide to do it of sussing out um, others as well. You know, what is the program mm -hmm. in your body? What is others conditioning? And we do too, but we more have this, this is who we be. And if we just be that, then that is the the key for us. Well, for you, it's a little different. And so it's a longer process. And I love the way that you begun, began your share that way, that it's a longer mm -hmm. process for you. Because if you mm -hmm. feel something, some kind of way in your body, you, you get to only over time, you've just met human design. I imagine in seven years, you're going to know what 61 feels like in a person who's uh, deconditioned, what 24 feels like in a, in a completely aware human being, what you feel like when the sun is here, you're going to, you're going to have the data for all of that. And, and you are going to have body experience to put with that data over that time, but it just takes a lot longer for you. I also wanted to add something that I got in my, you know, we, we've all here had these moments of mystical awakening. Uh, all of us here have had these moments that we dismiss as, uh, oh, I must've had something happened. You had a fucking mystical experience. You woke mm -hmm, up mm -hmm. something. Like, let's claim what we had. This is not something that just monks in the cave have anymore. If you are not waking up, you will die soon. I hate to be a doomsday person, but waking up is the thing we're doing. It's the time. We're popcorn and it's hot enough and we're popping. And so this is what we're all doing. And so let's make mystical experiences. Like, high five. You had one too. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. 
because we're becoming, we're having these opportunities. And I want something that I gained in my experience was the knowing that the frequency with which I take in food is the frequency with which it goes to work in my body. Mm -hmm. Let's say that again. I used to go to uh, McDonald's and get the double quarter pounder and Shane eat shit like as fast <laughs> as I could in a parking lot. Yes. Shame eat. <laughs> <laughs> I would do that. I would, oh, uh, I had a bad week. I'm going to go get a dozen Krispy Kremes. <laughs> I, I went there with the intention of soothing something bad, wrong, and shameful. And that's how I used food. When, mm -hmm. And this is why food turned on me. So then I realized, oh my gosh, I can absolutely go to the Krispy Kreme. When I go to the Krispy Kreme and I know, or I, I don't go to McDonald's anymore because my body loves itself too much, but I definitely will take a donut a time <laughs> or two. And that donut, I I am so excited. I meet that yeah. donut glee. <laughs> I meet that donut like a long lost friend that we've met again and we get to devour each other. You know, this is how I meet a donut these days. And that's the way a donut goes to work in my body. Like it is my long lost friend and it is doing exactly what it needs and it leaves when it's time to leave. So whatever that looks like, I know that to be true. I know that to be true with the people that are around me. I know that to be true about everything. The frequency with which I take it in is the frequency with which it goes to work in my body. My only job is to bring it in at the highest frequency I possibly can. Uh, I felt very passionate about that. That gave me a little lump in my throat. Yeah, I mean, and the, the, the actual, I love what you said about the donut because it was fascinating. I was really surprised, genuinely surprised about what I could eat and lose weight. Like <laughs> I was having like, I want this, you know, I want a hot dog. Mm -hmm. I want a scoop of ice cream in a, in a, in a cone and eat it while I walk, while I go yeah. on a walk. And I was doing that all day. And then so people would ask me, how did you lose all the weight? I lost like 60 pounds in, in probably like six or seven months. And they're like, how did you do that? Uh, <laughs> I was like, I just stopped with the story. Like, I literally said that. That was why I'm like, I don't know what. For the longest time, I was like, I don't even know what to tell you because if I tell you I started eating ice cream and hot dogs, you're gonna be like, what? Yeah. But I was like, I just stopped the story. Like, I just knew it. Like, I was just like, I'm done with the bullshit that I keep telling myself that it's gonna be this or this is the way or this type when they're for other people. I like I recognize that's not for me. Yeah. And just like coming into like um doing it for you. I ended up influencing three three other people in my office and they did the same. They they and they were just so thankful and grateful to me and they're just telling me thank you so much for like you know being this role model in this way, like I, I didn't think I could do this. It was easy and, and I feel great. And so we kind of had this rapport with, you know, these couple employees for a while. Like, I wouldn't say keeping us in check at all. Cause again, it was like, everything felt right where we didn't meet. It wasn't like, did you do, were you able to survive today? Did you not cave in or something like that? It was just like, everything was kosher in mine and those people's bodies. And it just felt right. It was awesome. Your body, our bodies are designed to move toward what supports life and with no judgment on a donut or a broccoli. <laughs> and we, we just have these beautiful mechanisms called a brain that have the capability of getting in the way of that. And I want to remind us just the last thing I'll share before we go, because this has been long, I love it. But I, I want to remind us that we are infants with this brain, that we have been in human form in one, one way or another, uh, Neanderthal, primate, uh, homo sapien. We have been in human form only for a very <laughs> short blip of time in the bigness of time uh, and of the bigness of all the species in the world. We're like the babies. So I want to imagine that, um, and what I mean by we're the babies is our brains, the fact that we have an amygdala and a prefrontal cortex and we can think about thinking about thinking about things. This is new. And so I want us to imagine and to know that we are like two-year-olds. Our brains are like a two-year-old. You know, when a two-year-old is playing, it's real. 
whatever it is that they're playing, you know, like it is real. No one can convince them that their whatever it is that they're playing, their dress up, their Spider-Man is not real, right? You cannot, maybe not two years old, maybe we're moving more to like three or five, but you know, they cannot, you, they cannot be convinced that they are not that thing that they are dressed up as until you are able to show them something, a mirror, a different set of clothes, until you give them more information. And then they're able to make a decision based on that more information. This is what our brains are doing. Our brains are babies. And our brains, we have just gotten this neurology. And our brains think that they know what is best for us. And we are in the process now. This, this life, this 84-year life that Brandy is living is a process of nurturing this five-year-old into a bigger awareness. Why do I say that? Why did that come up? It came up because as we talk about love and aging and parenting and body issues and food and uh, what, what keeps getting pointed back to me is that all of these things are our young minds believing this play. I just want to leave us with the remembrance that we can take an eagle eyes view and we can still be the mouse that's down in the ground, right? Living life, doing its thing. But remember that we can always, whenever we get scared, to be the eagle. You can be both and to see what that mouse is doing and to see the purpose of the fear, to see the purpose of the body issues, of the being inside of this body not just the trauma, but of course, a reflector doesn't get inside of the body as a part of living in this culture that we live in, of course. But when the reflector can take the eagle eye view and see that her, uh, what you've just done is seeing that your frequency dictates your experience. Your perception is the thing that gives you your reality. You free everybody. We free people. Just doing that is like, it's like um, popping the popcorn next to you, right? You popped. You're no longer a kernel. You're like, hmm, here I am. And you're like, oh, still a kernel. Ding, ding. <laughs> pop. And this one pop just by being next to it. Love that. Hmm. Well, I hope this has been fulfilling and useful. And again, I will put it in my Discord room with these PDFs once I fix them. I'd love to hear how it goes, guys. I'm excited. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Thanks for showing up. Thank you, Brandy. You're very, very welcome. Thank, Thank you. you, Brandy. Mm -hmm. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Okay.